then you have to, you know, that right. You have Hi, this is Ava Lenoir from MHTC. Um, just checking in with our presenters before we get started. Um, Dr. Dugas, um, can you hear us and are you able to um, speak? Hi, yep, I can hear you guys. Great, thank you. And um, Beverly Ruiz? I'm here. If you don't mind. Great, thank you. And Dr. Steinle? Yes, I'm here. Great, right, thank you so much. Well, um, just wait a couple more minutes before we get started. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we'll get started. The Maryland Healthcare Commission thanks everyone for joining today's webinar on enhancing patient involvement in telehealth, readiness, engagement, and adherence. This is the fourth session in our multi-part series of learning sessions focused on implementation and sustainability of telehealth. We are very excited to bring you today's webinar highlighting key topics of patient readiness and fit for telehealth interventions. We've selected these presenters due to their expertise in the field. The first presentation from a former MHCC telehealth grant awardee will present on a patient screening tool developed to assess determinants of health that help better target enrollment efforts and maximize potential telehealth benefits. We thank them for their continued commitment to providing valuable information to the telehealth community and sharing their lessons learned. The second presenters are from the University of Maryland and will discuss individual characteristics associated with greater engagement and adherence with telehealth interventions aimed at chronic disease self-management. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping issues. We are recording this webinar and will make it available to those who weren't able to participate today. At this time, all webinar participants are in listen-only mode to limit any background noise during the presentation. Mm -hmm. After the presentation, we will have a 15-minute Q&A session. Participants who have questions should include them in the question window, and my colleague will read these out loud to the presenters at the time of the Q&A session. All right, so let's move on to our first presentation, which is from Beverly Ruiz from the Gilchrist Elder Medical Care, and she is a primary nurse practitioner there. 
So go ahead, Beverly. I'll advance the slides for you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. A little technical difficulty there. Uh, so I'm a nurse practitioner with the Gilchrist Elder Medical Care Home Services. Um, and this is just a kind of a recap of some of our experiences in using our telehealth. The purpose, as shown here, was to demonstrate the impact of telehealth technology in supporting value-based uh, care delivery in primary care through expanding access to health services and addressing the needs of different patient populations that we serve. Um, the patients we selected for this had multiple comorbidities um, so that we could best see what our outcomes would be with this intervention. This is our patient selection flowchart for our telehealth pilot. Um, obviously, these were patients that had been admitted to our elder medical care home services program. Uh, step one was to find out if they were willing to utilize the telehealth equipment. Um, obviously, a, a no is a pretty hard stop. Uh, yes, however, did allow us to take the next steps, which included, did the patient have internet connectivity? Um, another potential hard stop would have been, um, they don't. However, some of our homes, we were able to use a hotspot to try to um, obtain internet connectivity. We do serve a variety of areas, though, some without good connectivity, and unfortunately, um, we were not able to establish good access in all of our locations where we did have a willing patient. However, if they did have internet connectivity, we then moved on to our next step, which was the patient and or family consented to utilize uh, the unit, and if they did agree to having the unit in the home and participating in the pilot program, then we could move forward um, in complete medical and home evaluations. This is a copy of the screening tool that we utilized, which gave us information on the patient and some of the items that we were screening for. As we move to the next slide, we'll go through um, why we had the tool, and really that was, a, it was developed in conjunction with our medical team, so our nurse case manager in the office, as well as our nurse practitioners, and then the nurses monitoring our devices that would receive the alerts. This was to allow us to have some structure and parameters for notification of the clinician, either the nurse practitioner or the physician, when a reading was out of range. Um, any triggering alert notified a call or received a call from the patient got a call from the nurse who was then monitoring um, for these alerts. So um, unfortunately, we don't have the slide side by side here, but the previous slide, which went over the monitoring request, gave parameters such as um, highs and lows on systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure. Uh, for patients using a glucometer, we could put ranges in there as well. We also had weight. Did the patient gain or lose weight in any frequency of time? Oxygen saturation, as our units did, uh, contain a pulse oximetry. Um, some of the other items further down had to do with motion detectors and environmental aids, which were not a part of our particular um, pilot program. So returning to the next slide, uh, again, if the patient fell out of range, it triggered an alert notifying the nurse monitoring um, the unit, and then that patient received a call right away from the nurse just to investigate further how was the patient feeling. Um, had they taken the medications yet? Because often we would find people out of, out of range if they hadn't used their blood pressure medicine yet for the day. And then we did find there were times that we needed to adjust the parameters so that the calls coming in made sense. So if we had somebody who was consistently high prior to a blood pressure reading, we, uh, excuse me, consistently high blood pressure reading prior to taking their medication, we might adjust that parameter or have a standard follow-up reading an hour later. A couple of patients who used our equipment um, we'll talk about next. And 
this gentleman was a 56-year-old patient, a younger patient for our particular program, but with multiple chronic disease states and medications. Uh, he was, because of, I think, his young age, very interested in the program and using the telehealth. Uh, he suffers from depression, chronic pain, and Crohn's disease. He had, was on 13 medications at the start of this, of this pilot program. So a couple of our goals are outlined there as to why we were utilizing telehealth for him. And one was de-escalation of cardiovascular medication. He was on a beta blocker, um, didn't exactly know why. He told us um, didn't have a, a cardiac condition or um, that we found that really lent itself to the use of the beta blocker. Um, certainly, we wanted to trend some vital signs and see where we were with him. We did find that in this particular case, we were able to remove the beta blocker from his routine medications and manage his uh, blood pressure with other medications, so one less medication for him. Uh, reassessment of his medical condition as well with um, a past diagnosis of diabetes, but again, not good information about where he was with this disease state. Um, we had him to check some uh, finger sticks. He was not on an oral agent, nor was he on insulin. Uh, and we were able then to decide, did he need just diet management or more? Additionally, um, with his history of depression and some isolation, we wanted to try to use a screening tool to get a sense of where was he with his depression and how well were we managing it. Um, so we could use a PHQ-9 score when we made visits in the home, and then our monitors allowed for a daily assessment with, which just gave some general ideas. How are you feeling today? How did you sleep? Did you drink alcohol? Things like that. The next slide shows us another patient, a bit older, with uh, multiple chronic disease states and medications as well, 11 medications at start. His pertinent past medical history included hypertension, atrial fibrillation, history of DVT, PVD, and neuropathy. Uh, for him, the cardiovascular monitoring included his trending of his vital signs because his blood pressure was a challenge for us to control, as well as um, assess if he was meeting his goals of therapy and to titrate his medications as well. Um, interesting side note on this gentleman, um, again, very engaged with the program. We were able to pick up some irregularity with his pulse. It was a feature of uh, the telehealth unit that we had access to, which did allow us then to follow up with his cardiologist and do a Holter monitor in the home where we learned he was in atrial fibrillation more often than we thought. Um, he was another <laughs> medication in here, and he was one of our challenges. Um, we were able to set up a medication reminder on the telehealth unit, which did allow a reminder to go off at a time we determined with him to take his medications every day. Um, much like a snooze on an alarm clock, once he got used to it and could kind of hit the snooze button, so to speak, without thinking about it, uh, we did find that we had to change that sound to get his attention. <laughs> um, next, the patient empowerment point here, it, it did allow him to feel like he managed his own health greater with the assistance of the medical team and the medication reminders. And last, potential use for review wellness reports within the Grand Care Monitor and other home health providers. Essentially, what we were able to do is use his unit to share information between the home health agency, seeing him, our team, as well as our pharmacy support team. This gives us an idea about the impact from our perspective. So as far as care delivery, we felt it enabled our Gilcrest providers to work with the interdisciplinary team, our Gilcrest team, the nurses, the pharmacy, the service coordinators, and the providers to make informed and objective decisions in daily medical care. Some of the examples of blood pressure medication titration or adjustments in the diabetic regimen, allowing us to do this days to weeks with, rather than weeks to months and producing better outcomes for our patients. Our risk assessment scores uh, enabled medication deprescribing, decreased hospital stays, better managed patients overall, and decreasing the risk for readmission. 
efficiency, um, we felt it allowed for an alternate met method of assessment by way of video chat, as well as care log to communicate patient needs, and therefore using the provider's time more efficiently. At the end of the program, we did ask our patients to um, complete a satisfaction survey, and you can see here the questions that they were asked as well as our average scores. Um, overall, I think you can see that um, if it was a one to five, a scale of one to five, our patients overall were very satisfied um, with the program with the overall satisfaction of five. We just included here some of the comments that we got and feedback from our patients. Um, glad to see that they were selected to be part of the program. Um, things like telehealth is great. We were called angels. <laughs> um, appreciative for everything that, that folks had done for this group of patients. Um, and also feeling some though like they needed additional help. Um, we did have some that were um, unsure of the degree of technology um, with the variety of ages in our program. We do have some folks that are more um, fearful of the technology that we have access to today. And so there still were some folks that felt like maybe they needed a bit more help. Um, the units did come with a pendant that the patient could wear or um, put with, with them on a wheelchair walker, et cetera. Uh, they could push the button for assistance if they needed it, if they needed to reach the nurse rather than having to touch the telehealth screen. Thank you so much, Mr. Rich, for that really valuable information. Um, we're gonna save questions from your presentation to the uh, end of the um, session. So our next presentation is from uh, Dr. Nanette Steinl, the Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and from Dr. Michelle Dugas, a po postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Health Information and Decision Systems and the, at the University of Maryland. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Steinle. I will describe a pilot study that we did um, actually, in addition to my appointment in the University of Maryland, I have a VA, Veterans Administration, appointment. And we conducted this pilot at the Baltimore VA in a cohort of older veterans who have type 2 diabetes. And what we did was we uh, have been partnering with our collaborators at the University of Maryland in College Park to develop a, a mobile app that can be used to bridge patients between their regular diabetes visits. I will say that the Baltimore VA also has a very active telehealth program that is run by nurses. And this app is actually a little different. Um, the traditional telehealth program uh, monitors blood glucose, uh, weight, uh, blood pressure, um, and the app actually um, was designed to help the patients not only look at their uh, glucose levels, but we asked about medication adherence, food intake, physical activity. And um, the app, uh, the, the patients imported their own data into the app and then it communicated with uh, our team. And the person on the clinical side that led the team was a certified diabetes educator. So then rather than having uh, episodic or periodic contact, actually the veterans were able to be in contact with their team um, sort of you know, on a daily basis as needed. And the idea was to see if A, older veterans would use technology and B, you know, could this type of technology be implemented to improve care? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the provider uh, side in terms of feasibility. For our pilot, we had 30 veterans um, that were provided with a tablet. And the tablet had the app preloaded. They came once for an information session where they received instructions about how to use the app. They were provided with um, 90 days of internet service uh, for the app as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then Michelle will talk about 
the specific features of the, the patients that we evaluated to determine who might be best for this type of intervention. Next slide. So of course, as people in the audience likely know, um, healthy behavior is really the core. It's the foundation of treatment for type 2 diabetes. And what we really wanted to see is uh, could we impact healthy behavior through use of this app? Um, the, the, the participants were um, given some diabetes self-instruction, but it was part of their usual care, not specifically through the app. If they had specific questions, they could ask that, and the, the diabetes educator would reply back uh, through a text message or a phone call. So um, those were the, the, the differences in our traditional versus a, approach to this. Next slide. So M Health, mobile health is low cost. It, we we do believe that improves it improves communication with the care team. It allows some personalized coaching. Um, we did find in this uh, instance that uh, glycemic control was improved, and certainly um, in our hands, the more a veteran. Uh, engaged with the app, the better their glycemic control was. But other studies that have been done looking at a meta-analysis type of information does show that using mHealth and personalized coaching can improve diabetes control as much as a, a medication can uh, by, by half to 1%. Next slide. So our, our pilot was called Diasocial. The patients, as I said, were given a tablet. Um, we had some social and gamification features where uh, a subset of the participants were assigned uh, to participate with one another as a team. So they could communicate not only with the CDE and their care team, but with one another. And so they could compete with who has the best glucose today, who did the most activity. Um, we didn't, we did not, uh, track weight in the study, but they could that could be another feature. And studies have shown that when participants have um, sort of competition with one another, that that is also another strategy that can be used to improve self-care. Our, our primary outcome in this study was a hemoglobin, reduction in hemoglobin A1c. Next slide. So this is what a screenshot that would look like uh, from one of the patients. And so you can see along the left, um, they input their glucose, how much time they exercised, whether or not they took their medications, and what they ate. And what you see, those numbers are actually points that they were assigned. So each participant, uh, if they you know, had a glucose that was uh, normal, they received a certain uh, point. And again, this was the gamification period or, or point so that um, each person could gain points um, and as they engaged in taking care of their self-diabetes. The red on Sunday means that that patient just didn't put any information in, so that day no points were assigned. And each day the, the points were tallied. At the end of the week they were tallied. And for the for the participants who were on the team, each team member also knew uh, what the other teammates, how many points they had earned. So again, sort of uh, creating a, a scenario where patients are, were somewhat motivated to um, do their best to gain as many points as possible. Next slide. Okay, Michelle, we'll talk about um, the the assessments and some of the findings. Great, uh, thanks, Annette. So as Dr. Stanley mentioned, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the characteristics we looked at in relation to mHealth adherence. Um, so my background is in social psychology, and that's kind of the literature we drew from to inform our decision about what characteristics to look at in the pilot. Uh, so developed in the social psychological literature, regulatory mode theory posits that Two independent orientations underlie most self-regulation, locomotion and assessment. Uh, locomotion refers to a preference for movement from state to state, and you can say it's captured by the phrase, just do it. 
whereas assessment, on the other hand, reflects a preference for evaluating states and alternatives and can be characterized by the phrase, do the right thing. Uh, these two dimensions of regulatory mode are orthogonal, meaning you can be low or high on both, or low in one and high in the other. Uh, and the orientations have been shown to be differentially related to a wide range of phenomena in the literature, including regret, burnout, and risk taking. Uh, and in line with theory in the scientific literature, we hypothesize that regulatory mode orientations could be important in influencing the effectiveness of interventions, particularly those centered around goal setting and self monitoring, as in the case of our M Health application, Diasocial. And we thought locomotors in particular might benefit from an M Health app's role in providing patients with a specific salient health behavior goals, procedures like gamification that uh, Dr. Finley reviewed in our app. Uh, but we also expected assessors to benefit due to kind of a better fit between their preferences for evaluation and the self-monitoring features of the app that uh, kind of align with the quantified self. So people can better uh, understand how they're doing uh, and potentially in relation to others if they're assigned to uh, one of the team groups as well. So the next slide, um, I'll show you the, the tool that we use to assess locomotion and uh, assessment. So here you can see the six items we employed to measure both. Uh, we used a patient's average score uh, in response to the six items uh, for both locomotion and assessment. They end up with two scores, one for locomotion and one for assessment. And these items were rated on a scale of one to five from uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And this is actually a brief version of a longer scale that was developed, uh, I guess now over a decade ago, and has since been used in dozens of peer-reviewed articles. So we were drawing from uh, a broad literature when we decided on these, uh, on these particular scales. Uh, and to test our hypotheses that I mentioned earlier, we were interested in first exploring how scores of locomotion and assessment based on these scales were associated with different levels of treatment adherence. And for our study, we defined uh, adherence as the scores or points earned as patients track their self-management behavior. So kind of as Dr. Steinle alluded to, uh, better behaviors earned patients more points. So for example, taking all of your medications and recording it in the app uh, earned you more points than only taking some medications. So in other words, uh, more points or a higher score indicated better adherence for our pilot. On the next slide, um, just a brief summary that as, as expected, uh, both assessment and locomotion scores predicted better adherence over the course of our 13 week trial. So overall, high assessment was associated with really increasing adherence over time, whereas low assessment kind of showed a downward trend in adherence over the 13 week period. This isn't actually depicted in the, the figure presented here, but it's kind of more of like a straightforward uh, linear relationship. Uh, maybe more interestingly, locomotion was associated with a much higher adherence early on, but kind of like a quadratic trend where there was the, a downturn a little bit in the latter half of the study, maybe suggesting a, a little bit of boredom or like the novelty wearing off for these, uh, these folks. Uh, but as you can see, low locomotion, the dashed line of the figure, kind of showed a stable lower level of adherence over time based on their, their uh, app scores. Um, overall, though, when comparing locomotion and assessment, it was uh, locomotion that had the stronger relationship with adherence um, compared to assessment. So their scores were particularly high. Uh, so we found these relationships interesting, but they were kind of like only important to us if our measure of adherence was related to our clinical outcome of interest, which Dr. Stanley mentioned was HbA1c for us. So next, we explored whether higher adherence scores, as measured by, that, uh, by the points earned through use of the gamification app, uh, were actually associated with larger jobs in HbA1c. Uh, on the next slide, there's a figure kind of showing uh, this trend where People who had high adherence scores, uh, you can see that the trend comparing baseline to post-intervention uh, HbA1c with the dashed line 
those people on average showed a significant drop in HbA1c. It was about, I think, about a, a point um, in value of HbA1c. And in contrast, the people with lower adherence scores, the solid line there, uh, they showed no change in the clinical outcome. So they didn't really benefit from the intervention as much. But together, I think these results suggest that regulatory mode orientations as an individual difference measure uh, contribute to M health adherence. And in turn, this greater adherence actually does translate into better clinical outcomes for people, at least over this initial kind of like 13 week, about three month period. So I think we'll, I'll get it back to Dr. Steinle to talk a little bit more about her observations uh, as a clinician and how the trial went. Thank you, Michelle. So overall, uh, we felt that this tool could actually be very useful and helpful. And there are um, a number of diabetes apps that are in the marketplace. Um, and so some of the unique features about this, um, you know, were the game featuring. And, and we did find, especially in our veteran uh, population, that uh, they enjoyed having the ability to uh, interact with one another through the app. Um, we did feel like certainly older patients are indeed willing uh, to, to use uh, and use technology. Um, you know, finding ways to maintain interest is critical. So it's like any sort of game or new thing that one engages in after time, the novelty wears off. But I think, um, you know, the veterans and the participants who find that their overall care is improved, if we're able to reduce their medications, that continues to motivate them to uh, continue to engage. So we still need to learn more about individual differences and preferences and how to better um, personalize these uh, types of approaches because we do recognize certainly that one size does not fit all. Next there. So um, potential challenges going forward, I mentioned personalization. Um, integration with the healthcare system. So this particular app did not integrate with our medical record. And we feel very strongly that as we go forward, we need to be able to have a system, whereas if the patient is importing information that it could be received in a similar way to a secure message or um, any other communication that the patient would uh, send to their provider through the EMR, and certainly this was a small trial and we need to um, engage larger groups of individuals um, and do you know, more randomized uh, clinical trials to uh, show that you know, these things actually do work when implemented on a large scale. We do sort of hypothesize that this technology could be used to keep patients out of the ER to prevent hypoglycemic events and um, again to overall just improve their care and communication with their healthcare team. So I do want to acknowledge the uh, our collaborators at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, we had several people on our team in addition to myself and Michelle including a summer student named Tim Zhu, who did a lot of the initial work. Lillian Penault is our, uh, she's a CDE and RD who interacted fairly extensively with the patients during the trial and certainly want to acknowledge the patients themselves for participating. And with that, I will uh, conclude and hand the floor back to our, our host. Great, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. That was very informative. Um, we will now open it up for questions and answers. So please give us a moment as we review any posted questions. Um, so if you have a question as a reminder, just enter it into the question window and then we will read them aloud for you. Um, so we can wait a little bit as people um,
Um, so we have one for the first um, presentation for uh, Ms. Beverly Ruiz. If you could uh, talk to us a little bit more about some of the lessons learned um, during the project, that would be really great. One of the things that, that we learned is that certainly not everybody is, is into technology. <laughs> Probably goes without saying, and, and our, 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 all of the presenters here may have learned that with, with our folks we worked with with this. Um, we did have patients who were younger as evidenced in, or as demonstrated in this first slide, that first slide of the patient, Mr. J.W., who found this to be really innovative and he was excited to be a part of this versus a patient we did not highlight here who was in her early 90s. Uh, we tried to utilize this for, mostly for the scale option as she had a history of congestive heart failure and the need to weigh herself daily. Um, our units came with a camera feature for video chat and we had to cover her camera um, before she would step on the scale. So we did learn that you know you do have to adapt your unit sometimes uh, so that patients feel comfortable in using it. Um, it really worked out in that situation because we were able to pick up on subtle weight changes and make adjustments to her diuretics as needed to keep her out of congestive heart failure and ultimately out of the hospital. Um, but that was one of the things we had to learn about is, is the fear of technology as well as um, we have a gentleman who was an engineer when he was in the working world and he really embraced it as well, keeping his own charts uh, in addition to what we could show them that we could graph and do on our unit. Great, thank you for that. So we do have a question. Uh, this question is from Pamela Fodel. Um, the question, I believe it's more general to both uh, of the, or all of the present presenters. Are any of these programs being piloted with a view um, to being able to bill for services to insurance companies. Um, so I guess we'll uh, let um, um, Ms. Beverly Roos uh, maybe take that and then move on to um, Dr. Steinol and Duga. I do know there are billing codes. We have looked into this. I, we have not mastered this as a practice at this time to be able to bill for any of this, but I do know it's out there and it does exist. So this is Dr. Steinle. We actually absolutely are uh, wanting to capture um, our costs through billing. And there's actually a, a diagnosis code or a code, not a diagnosis code, but a billing code for remote data monitoring. And you can, I think the Medicare reimbursement currently is close to $50 where you document that you've monitored remote data. You can bill once a month. Um, for that and that was the approach that we hope to uh, build into our system we want to look at how um, you know the use of our educator time um, can be most uh, used most efficiently um, and yet to capture that so we we do indeed uh, definitely are looking at, at those costs and cost recovery Great, thank you. Um, we have a question for the second presenters uh, from the University of Maryland. And the question is, how can an app as the one that you described be used to augment traditional telehealth or clinic visits? So this is Dr. Steinle again, I'll answer that. So the way that we envision this working um, is, for example, uh, the patient comes and uh, let's say their diabetes is out of control. They, you know, don't adhere to what they should take in terms of their meds, their diet, their exercise. So we would, you know, get introduce them to the idea of the mobile app and get them signed up for the app, and they would start using it. Um, there are, like I said, commercial apps that are out there. Um, I actually do use one of the commercial apps in my practice. Um, so the patient gets enrolled while they're in the clinic because it's all done on their phone while they're while they're at the visit. 
and then I start receiving their information. So as I mentioned, what, what the what the app that I'm using now doesn't have is sort of a, a way for me to reply to the patient through the app. I can send them a secure message and say, Mr. X, I received your data. It looks like X, Y, and Z. Um, and all of this is done between their visits. And if I'm billing using that remote monitoring code, um, then I can capture some of my time. Um, at the VA, we can actually um, capture workload credit with phone calls. I know that that's not standard outside of the VA, but if it's a VA patient, I can call and then I get what we call workload credit for that phone call and, and it's captured in 10 minute in increments up to 30 minutes. So I do incorporate this into my practice, but I think for people who can't specifically bill for phone calls, they can use that remote data monitoring and it's, it's $50, uh, it's about $50 uh, a month that can be uh, reimbursed at least through Medicare. Now other insurances, I can't say for sure if they followed suit with, with Medicare, they often do, but the, there is a code um, for that through Medicare. And so we basically use it. Um, the other patient population that it helps are the, the missed appointments. So people come from far away and they say, you know, you start them on a new medication and you want to uh, have a review of how they're doing. They can send their glucose data through the app to you and you can review it and then follow up with them, like I said, through phone or through a secure message. Great. Thank you. So our next question comes from uh, Nathan Weinsberg. Um, could you discuss how you went about this continuation of the telemonitoring equipment? Maybe you can talk a little bit about the uh, how patients were transitioned off or graduated from the program. And uh, I think it could go to either presenter. If we can start with um, Beverly Ruiz. Beverly, are you on the line? Is that better? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> technical issues here. Um, so what I was saying is that we, when we found our patient stabilized, so for example, if it was a patient where we were doing titration of blood pressure medications, when we felt that we had reached a point that they were stable in their readings and tolerating the medication well, um, we would then take the unit out of that home and relocate it to another home where we could do the same with the next patient. Oh, this is Dr. Stein again from uh, the U University of Maryland in the Baltimore VA. We, when we uh, recruited the people for this pilot, they knew that it was uh, going to be a specific time frame for their participation. And then once once we finished this this pilot, if they wanted to continue, or if we felt it was important for them to continue to be monitored, we put them into the VA's traditional telehealth program uh, where they have a special meter and they download their meter into their phone weekly then that goes that that information goes to a nurse um, so we were we had another alternative the the app program that i mentioned that i actually use um, that's an app that's on their phone so that it doesn't end as long as they continue to want to use the the app and send me a report then there's 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 no sort of cutoff and there's no investment in terms of equipment because as long as the patient has a phone with service they can continue to use the app and it's free they don't they don't pay money for for that great thank you um, so we have another question for uh, Ms. Beverly Ruiz, and the question is, um, and I think you've alluded to this a little bit, but if you could provide some additional information on if there is a particular population that does well with telehealth and sort of on the other side of that, a population that does not do well with telehealth. 
Sure. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about folks that don't have a fear of technology, um, but to add to that, anyone that had a supportive caregiver, we felt that that was beneficial to our patients as well. So if there was um, a spouse or an adult child or a, a regular caregiver in the home that could help, um, that we felt we got better outcomes with that as well. Um, many of our patients on this program, if not all, did also receive support of our pharmacy team. And so it did allow for um, additional support, not just the provider from our program making the home visits, as well as the nurse from the telehealth monitoring program, but that we had the pharmacy team involved as well. And, and patients who had multiple touch points along the way certainly did better with understanding and being comfortable with the program. Great, thank you. So we have another question. Um, this is from Phyllis Gray. Um, it's a two-part question. So, um, and this will be for um, all the presenters. Is the app or the, um, the software being used secure per HIPAA? Um, particularly, if you could speak a little bit about that uh, on the mHealth side, given that um, uh, if they're using their own device. So this is Dr. Steinley. I'll answer that. Yes. So all of the, uh, for the pilot, we had to uh, work with the VA IT to make sure that we had secure <clears throat> um, internet. Um, we had all of our patients use a sort of a code name so they didn't use their actual name so that if there was a breach, their data wasn't connected to their actual name, date of birth, and so forth. Um, on the commercial side, the uh, developer of that particular app does meet all of the security uh, requirements as per specified by HIPAA, FDA, and, uh, or FAA, and, and so forth. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ruiz, do you have anything to add? No, we did very similar with making sure that the equipment met all of the guidelines um, out and these, it was in their home and they're really, um, it wasn't on a personal device, so to speak. So um, I think that that helped us a bit with that. Um, there's always concerns for data breach, but yes, we did have to do much of the same to make sure that um, the Gilcrest IT department was comfortable with using these devices in the way that, that we did utilize them. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Steinle. Um, what unique features are present in the approach that you described that differ from other traditional telehealth approaches? So um, the traditional telehealth programs that I'm familiar with um, for diabetes look specifically at blood sugar um, you know, they record the patient's blood sugar information and whether or not they took their meds. Um, this particular program that we used also, we included nutrition information where they could input what they were eating. So that allowed the RDCDE to evaluate their food choices and give them feedback there. Um, we also recorded their information. Some of the patients, not all of them, um, had Fitbits, some of them had um, had step counters. And so they were actually able to input their, their data on how many steps they did or how many minutes of physical activity they engaged in. So we had what I think was a, a more complete picture of the patient's lifestyle rather than just asking them to present us with their glucose results. Great, thank you. Um, and we have one more question for you again, Dr. Steinle, which is, and or um, Dr. Duga, um, which is, what tools might be used to determine which patients might benefit most from telehealth or M Health? So, Michelle, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, as I mentioned, my background in social psychology, kind of looking at these motivational questions. 
So I might be biased, but I think there are a lot of tools in the social psychology and behavioral science literature that can be used to help us identify great candidates for these types of interventions. Now, uh, we use a particular tool that, you know, I had experience with and I was familiar with, but there are a lot of different features to many of these telehealth-oriented uh, interventions and mHealth like ours, like for example, the gamification feature might appeal to people who are more competitive uh, than people who are less competitive. So, you know, I think we're happy with the tool that we used in finding how it was related to adherence and outcomes. But um, there are other, you know, individual characteristics that might map well onto different uh, intervention characteristics that are also out there and can be useful. Um, also, like the big five, if you're doing a, a team-oriented intervention, maybe something like an extroversion tool could be useful in helping uh, patients. Uh, and a lot of these tools are relatively short, you know, two to five items. Uh, it does present an additional barrier on our burden on physicians and their patients, but uh, may be feasible enough to use an implementation still. Great, thank you. So we have another question, um, and the question uh, can be for either uh, presenters. Was there planned or scheduled phone contacts with the patients aside from responding to the alerts or the information provided to um, the providers via the dashboard? And we could start with Beverly Ruiz. Yes, as part of our program, we had the nurses with the telehealth unit um, make a visit each month. So if a patient was on the program, and, and most of ours, I, I neglected to add this earlier, we had people on for at least 60 days with, with each one of the units as the minimum. Uh, but the nurse had to make a visit at least once a month um, as a check on the system, how were things going, reevaluation of the patient while they were um, in our program. So for, this is Dr. Steinle again. For the diasocial pilot, we did not have specific um, interaction or time scheduled interaction after the initial uh, meeting. It was an in-person meeting where they were shown uh, the app and how to use it. We did at that meeting tell them that we expected to hear from them at least on a weekly basis. And then if there was no data being inputted, for example, uh, then the CDE reached out again by phone or secure message uh, to the participant to see if they, you know, they were, if there was a problem with the app, you know, if there were any issues with um, them to let them know that we hadn't received any data and then to ask them to please, you know, submit their data. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for um, the the presenters for the diasocial pilot. Can you speak a little bit to the next steps of that pilot and other um, investigations that you might do potentially around the the uh, challenges that you noted in one of your slides around um, customization or personalization of the application? Perhaps are you considering any sort of interviews uh, uh, with the patients to understand how, how it could be uh, better customized to, to meet their needs and keep them engaged? So Michelle, do you want to take that, and then I'll add anything. Uh... Sure. Um, so we're we're still doing uh, ongoing clinical trial studies. We're about to launch one in China recently. Um, but we, after the diasocial pilot at the VA, we did conduct some interviews that you know provided additional insight into the, the features that people want, uh, making the communication features better between teams. Um, as to the, the personalization, I think, you know, for us, we still need to do some additional uh, data collection to look at what 
features uh, could be most easily personalized. Um, certainly, one of the things that we're interested in is how to uh, maximize the peer team features. So, for example, whether some people would want to compete against each other in terms of the gamification versus just, you know, work within their team. Um, those kinds of features we think would be right for personalization, uh, as well as some of the, uh, you know, self-monitoring features, what features are, are most important for individuals and making it easier for them. Um, all that we're, we're hoping to get additional insights into with more data collection from a larger uh, clinical trial. So we actually have been continuing to work to secure uh, additional funding to, to take this, you know, to a larger uh, set of individuals um, and to look at implementation across various systems. So as you could imagine, implementing it at the VA is very different than implementing it in the practice at the University of Maryland versus a private practice. And so those are the types of questions um, that we are looking at now. We do have um, some applications that are under review, um, but one of the limitations is uh, the funding environment and, and getting the resources to um, expand the, the patient population so that we can get more data. And I believe, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that we had written our um, proposal would be that when the patients received the app, there would be some baseline personality uh, information that we would collect, and then we would use that data again um, to help predict who performed or engaged better with the app versus um, to help better identify who um, might not do so well with a tool like such as this. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So the hope is to, you know, do that baseline kind of individual characteristics and trait survey and then identify, you know, whether the app overall is good for them and then also specifically whether they benefit from certain features. Like if some people like the team aspect, but other people don't um, or, you know, like a more competitive atmosphere. Um, all those things we're hoping to get insights from based on their initial like personality survey at the beginning. Great, thank you. Um, this uh, last question is with, for Beverly Ruiz. Um, has there been any modifications to the screening tool, uh, given what you're, you're learning from patients or new patients? Um, and if so, what have been some of the modifications that have been made? No, we have not made any modifications at this time. Um, we have adjusted them based on what we've learned from our patients. So, for example, if a patient consistently has a certain systolic or diastolic blood pressure reading and we know that we need to adjust our parameter for alert, we either want it to be higher or lower, then we've made those individual adjustments based on um, our patients and their monitoring. But as a tool, no, we have not. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, so if um, you have any questions that um, you, we didn't get to or you didn't think of, definitely feel free to share that with us and we will share with the presenters and follow up with you via email after the webinar. Um, we thank you for attending today's Launch and Learn. A copy of the slides from today's webinar will be sent out to all who participated today via email. In that email, you will also find a link to a very brief post-webinar questionnaire and we ask you to please take a couple minutes and complete the questionnaire. Uh, we would really appreciate it as these responses are extremely helpful for us to continue to make our webinars more informative and help MHCC in planning the next Lunch and Learn webinar. So we are more, most interested in hearing from you regarding topics, topic areas of interest that we might highlight in a future Lunch and Learn session. Thank you again. We look forward to your continued participation and have a wonderful afternoon.